Well, welcome today to our Thanksgiving service setting. My name is Peter here, I'm the vicar here in Pavelin. Some of you will know that uh, I'm in a slightly strange position in that I've actually only been here as the vicar for, since uh, early September, which means that I'm perhaps the only person in the, in the church building today who didn't actually know Timmy. Uh, but it's clear from the many conversations and, and um, discussions that I've had with people uh, that she was just such a remarkable character, a, a very multifaceted one, and very much loved as well. And this is a day for many different emotions as well. I'm sure you all have your own memories of her. And this service is a time to remember her, to give thanks with prayers, with poems, with music, sharing memories, and singing some of her favourite hymns as well. Sue Ives will be speaking later on as well. I've just got one particular notice uh, to all those who have got a, a leading role, perhaps speaking or uh, as a musician. And we're going to aim for this service to be fairly seamless, so when it's your turn to speak or, or play uh, from the order of service, then do just come up. The, uh, the lectern is here for you to, to speak out, and the musicians, of course, are, are ready over there. So don't wait for a prompt or an introduction, just, uh, just come up and, uh, and speak or play. Just to say one other thing, uh, although this is a church service, uh, there will be times when I'm sure that it will feel appropriate to applaud. Uh, so do feel free to applaud at suitable times. I'm not quite sure whether Tilly would have approved of that entirely, <laughs> uh, but never mind. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you because you made us in your own image and gave us gifts in body, mind, and spirit. We thank you now for Timmy, for what she meant to us, and as we honour her memory, make us more aware that you are the one from whom comes every perfect gift, including the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. And our first hymn is all people that on earth you can.
In him I am, was born in Herefordshire over 70 years ago, where our roots were firmly planted in the countryside and country pursuits, based on the River Wye, horses, and Hereford cattle. Mm-hmm. A mother's home side in, only I say, Ross on Wye, became the home of my godfather, Philip Edwards, who helped sustain her roots in Herefordshire all her life. Fished on the Wye and shot pheasants with him. Of course, she made sure that I knew that fishing, like hunting and racing, needed no pronoun. And eventually, with Philip's help, she did catch a fish, which, <laughs> I was told, meant a salmon. <laughs> Granny Kelly moved her family to Bedford into Paris <coughs> Avenue in order to be near good schools for my mother, Margaret, Aunt Mary, Uncle John, and Anne, who was always a bit short. And so she stood on the tips of her toes in this big town house, hence Timmy Tiptoes, the Timmy we love and remember today. <laughs> Timmy was interviewed for the village, Villager magazine a few years ago, and some interesting facts emerged, such as the answer to the question, where did you go to school or university? Did you like it? I was a boarder at the Royal Masonic School in Rickmansworth, she said. They were, they were the eight most unhappy years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I narrowly missed making an, ad, an early departure when a teacher discovered that I was running a sweepstake on the Grand National. <laughs> exercise the only Oakley hounds in the school holidays. From the age of eight, I'd cycle out from Bedford to Milk Nernis, where the kennels were, at 6am, and we'd take hounds round the roads for about two hours. Charlie Abbott was the huntsman. These days, it wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> in the war, she wanted to get stuck in, and so she joined the Wrens, and was posted to Royal Navy, Royal Navy Gunnery School at Whale Island, where her mathematical ability was recognised, and she taught how to ship hit ships bobbing about on the obby. Mainly hard work, except it was a run out to sea. But that was ended prematurely by imminent action, when no wrens were allowed on board the destroyer. So she had to jump ship. She was rightly proud to have jumped from a destroyer to a launch in mid-ocean, only relying on being caught by two matelots. <laughs> <laughs> the family moved to a bungalow in Steddington, Spike, as Timmy called it all her life. It no doubt was the name, the village she learned from the, the name of the village she learned from the locals. She had many friends there, but one in particular sticks in my mind, and that was David Smith, where Timmy, who had a farm, where Timmy and her brother John went rabbiting. They were great sporting buddies. <laughs> Timmy told me how they lined up the rabbits along a hedge, waited for a train, for poor Mr. Beachy, and popped off while the lawyers covered the two two shots. <laughs> that was a cunning lady. <laughs> it was to Timmy's life of regret that her fun with Uncle John so sadly ended when he was killed in action as a rear gunner in Lancaster. But that was, that was just before my time, but my relationship with Auntie Tim was about to start, as it would continue, with adventures. The first adventure was reported to me by herself with a grin. And in 1947, it was very snowy, so Timmy and my brother John tied my cot onto a sledge to move me about the village. The inevitable result of enthusiasm was that I got tipped into a snow drift, no doubt a horror, only to be greeted by that venerable phrase, I'd luck! <laughs> <laughs> a phrase so well known to my sons that Tim has been known as hard luck Timmy in my family ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Granny, mother, Timmy and brother John and I moved to Hill Cottage here in Pavenham in 1947, yes, 60 years ago, again, oh, again, the villager interview gives us Timmy's view. How, why and how did you come to the village in the first place? Because we could get a bigger house for my mother, myself, my sister, and nephews to share. I can assure you that we all grew to love Bainham, swimming in the river, hunting the hedges and woods, mainly with the generous permission of the Tandy and Roth family. I know and love their land, thanks to them and the encouragement of Timmy. Timmy spent many years fly fishing and fly tying, using feathers from all sorts of fowl and animals, including the hackles of my bantam who was alive at the time. <laughs> but it wasn't all field. <coughs> it wasn't all field. <coughs> it wasn't all field sports. My mother and Timmy ran dances, 9 to 90, in the village hall. That wasn't the time, that was the age. <laughs> it was for the whole play competition. 
At Christmas, a gang of us walked the two miles from Close Road all through the village and on out to West End and the Roths, singing carols. We stopped at every house. I can't remember how we did it. <laughs> on Christmas Day, Timmy and I pushed a wheelbarrow with our turkey back from Mr. Cockwheat's bakery, where it had been cooked. At harvest, we decorated the church here, which looked fantastic, as it does today. Thank you so much. It must look beautiful. She was be so pleased. We then had a, a sale of the produce on the Monday. I had to buy a sheaf of corn for the cook. Oh. I find it difficult to separate myself from Timmy because of the enthusiasm she engendered in me and in so many other young people for our villages, our people, and our countryside. At Hill Cottage, we had a paddock of some four acres for Timmy's and mother's horses, including a pony for me, hacking to and from meats in the dark after cocoa before dawn. Exciting for a little boy, later heard jumping a ditch when the pony followed Tim's lead, shouting, Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> we made hay, turning it by hand, stacking and later cutting with a hay knife. Had to do. We had many pony club camps, rallies, Timmy as instructor, the mother as cook, and me trying not to get caught by Aunt Timmy in the girls' tents. <laughs> <laughs> Timmy, in this period, taught riding at pet schools. First at Kinder School, Kidderminster, and I remember going to Bedford School, Bedford Station, with her horse, Salt, loading him and Tim onto the train and seeing them off, set off far Oakley, Stevington, etc., to Northampton, a line being no longer there. She then took a job teaching riding at Abala, the prep school for Gordonston, filling in for sick teachers in a maths room where she made the subject more interesting than is normal. With her. <laughs> I went and visited her there and she tried catching pheasants with whiskey soaked raisins. <laughs> the only result was that the squirrels fell off the tree. <laughs> <laughs> I think Timmy was responsible for making four ten one Christmas. She also made me wait until Boxing Day if she liked things done properly. <laughs> the longest twenty four hours ever, but her hair was bagged in the paddock. I can still take you to that place. We grew turkeys, geese, bantams, chicken, partridges and ducks that and the latter took just 30 hours to hatch. Why? Because we got them from a tree that we found them in, walking to Stemmington for the fairground. When we got back and got the eggs, Timmy sent me around the village till I found a broody chicken for the ducks. I think it's the beasties who gave us a hen. We had a golden, <coughs> that time we had a golden retriever from Uncle Ian and Aunt Mary, my, my aunt. Silver, my first dog, what a great time. Led, of course, by Timmy followed by Spaniels, which came from Herefordshire through my, my godfather, Philip Edwards. Another great mm. sport. The zoo was the first dog, led to a great line of Spaniels, developed with the help of David Chudley, who became a close friend of Tim's. About this time, Timmy answered an ad in the lady, seeking a cook for a stalking house party at the corner in the galley. Over the next few years, Timmy went from cook to penny girl to firm family friend of the Ellis family. Who owned large parts of Glengarry. She told them she had a nephew at Sandhurst, and as they had a daughter who needed a partner for Glengarry Ball, I was invited. On arrival, I found them all talking to a person called Anne, and I looked around. I eventually realised that was Timmy. Sadly, that broke her Anne bubble, and she became Timmy there as well. <laughs> <laughs> you, will, you will hear more, more of this later, but again, I quote from the villager interview. Where's the best place you visited? In Vigari, on Rock Oil. It is just lovely. I used to have a cottage there. That says a lot. And she did, because Tini and Russell Ellis were so taken by Timmy that they gave her use of the cottage on Rock Oil. There are so many of us. I believe, somebody's counted it, it's 80 people stayed at that cottage with Timmy. Some, like Rex and Liddy, almost re rebuilt it. But it was not all play. One must earn an honest crust, as she often said. So off to Bedford College to train as a teacher. Again, in answer to the interview, she said, I specialise in history and maths. Why did you choose that career path? But while teaching riding at pet schools, I taught English to those who couldn't speak it and maths to those who couldn't do it. And hence, it seemed a natural transition. <laughs> so she went to Oakley School and started a new phase of her life. Because also, my mother and I moved away, and Timmy and her mother downsized to West Cottage. Sarah will take the pavement story on from there, because Sarah and many others who are here today became Timmy's family. In that reduced garden at West Cottage, Timmy reared partridges, pheasants and ducks, many of which were taken to Polworth Shoot, where she was a beater and picker-up. 
No surprises, she became a significant part of that sporting team. Paul Howard and Sid Pennington will tell you more today. Lastly, Tim found answer phones as trying as many as, as, trying as many of us do. But she had a memorable ending, which I will use so that we can move on. So let us imagine such a message based on a quote from her village and magazine. I believe the old saying, God and the Navy we adore, when danger threatens, not before. Over! <laughs> <laughs> by Rudyard Kipier. I have done mostly what most men do and pushed it out of my mind, but I can't forget if I wanted to, four feet trotting behind. Day after day, the whole day through, wherever my road inclined, four feet said, I'm coming with you, and trotted along behind. Now I must go by some other round which I shall never find, somewhere that does not carry the sound of four feet trotting behind.
everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. <coughs> about May's Howe burial, 
and rather reluctantly, I think, because he made a great fuss of the dogs and would have been much happier staying with them rather than talking to all these visitors. And uh, when he had to get underway, he said <coughs> very solemnly, this is my story and I shall only tell it once, so will you please listen? <laughs> Timmy loved and remembered that and applies this morning as well. <laughs> uh, Forty years ago, a boy from the city began work in Oakley at the school in the next village. It was lunchtime in the staff room, sandwiches ready. I was sitting by Miss Caddick and she took out her lunchbox, Tupperware, labelled rat. <laughs> I knew I'd moved to rural village. <laughs> I, I found out that the rat was an old label for ratatouille. <laughs> and that she had, of course, grown all the ingredients in her garden. So began a lot of information about growing, and I experienced forced sea kale, cutting the sparrowgrass, and we even had a blanched chicory contest one year. <laughs> well, I'm still getting there. Um, as you know, Timmy opened her lovely garden uh, as part of the uh, cancer fundraising many times. I soon saw West Cottage and met Mrs. Caddick, sitting in the same place, the same spot that we've seen Timmy in recent years. But Timmy was very active. Several of us young things were whipped in to sell race cards at the Oakley Hunt point to point. <laughs> Generally huddled in a horse box. Newton Bromswell is the coldest place in England. <laughs> we made forays to do our selling duty, and then the picnic, the cold pheasant, the slow gin. That's where I learned to make it. Don't use too much sugar and just five almonds. <laughs> The date of the point-to-point -point, um, coincided more or less with Tim's birthday, <coughs> who shared it with her. In later years, we were promoted to going as spectators, and continued going until the move away from the Harris's land. Tim would generally go up on the preceding Friday evening to do mysterious preparation. I think it involved a paintbrush and the whitewashing of various things that didn't move about. Sometimes there would be a phone call. Do you want to deal with a brace of pheasant? She taught me to pluck and dress by then. Or this hair has turned up. <laughs> Once there was a call, I've got a monk jack hanging in the garage. <laughs> Tell me a little bit. We did. Tim and I were both um, foodies of a sort, but more traditional than New Gulf cuisine. We were both curious to recreate rook pie. So came the call. I've got a dozen young rooks. I'll prepare them and you can make the pie. And very good it was too. We pickled walnuts. And by the way, July the 12th is the cutoff date for pickling your green walnuts. But no one will be phoning me to say that it's time to go, go a nutting this autumn unfortunately, which is something I've enjoyed doing before. Soon I was invited to Letterburn. Uh, this is the cottage that Tony mentioned in Lothwijk. Many of you will know how important Timmy's cottage in Scotland was to her. We would set off early, an hour before seven is worth two after, <laughs> in a car packed up to the guns. Yes, Letterburn was basic but I immediately and continually loved being there and got to know the surroundings very intimately with Tim's topography, including the very little local landmarks. The Maiden's Leap, a crag overhanging the lock by the Letterburn Road, <coughs> from which Tim's legend has it, despairing young girls might throw themselves, either because they still were or were no longer maidens. Salantia <laughs> <laughs> Rocks, La Cascade, which uh, is the waterfall right next to Letterburn, um, a, a French lady visiting exclaimed La Cascade when the, when the burn was in state. 
the causeway, the wooden bridge, many, many more. Our time was taken up with keeping the place going, sorting out the firewood, visiting the kitchen garden at Abba Holder, attending to Rex's water supply, which needed attention quite often, <laughs> mushrooming, shopping at the fort, and preparing for many visitors, which entailed whipping ourselves into a frenzy and mucking out the deep litter. <laughs> Tim and I sat not too long ago, and this has been mentioned already, to think about how many friends had visited or stayed at the cottage. And we came up with rather more than, than Tony's total, almost twice that many. We got to 150 plus when we gave up. That's people who came for the day or people who came and stayed. So that is just remarkable. It was a place that drew people. And there were local outings when we were up there. Tim had taught me to row. I did well. Not like Valerie, who did not get her Bridge of Oik rowing certificate <laughs> at the staff meeting when we were back at school. <laughs> and the only time I saw Timmy with a cigarette was when we landed after Val's rowing lesson. <laughs> she decided that she needed one. We went many times up to Loch Lundy, where I rowed and Tim fished. I fished a bit, and that was the only place I've had any success. Or up to the Milk Lock, where I was promised red-throated divers and great northern divers. They were there. I haven't been promised dead sheep, but <laughs> there are others here today who have helped drag out a very dead ewe from the water. <laughs> we collected skulls of dead animals from Jane in Cambridge, one of her friends. And I can remember driving back from London, holding a very pungent ewe's head out of the land of the windows. <laughs> well, it was a very good specimen. <laughs> As for Letterburn, we always arrived at a very bleak looking croft, but in half an hour, everything unloaded the fire lit in Rex's excellent new fire basket in the hearth. Rods hung, beds made up. Then it was dram time and supper was on. And as the occasions arrived, wonderful dinner parties with friends and family visiting. Always plenty of local produce, no trout if we were lucky, meat from the flesher. And I love that, the flesher. <laughs> he was always the flesher, not the butcher. And letter burnt gooseberries. And we both liked foraging for wild strawberries, blaberries, sep, chanterelle. Tim knew the best spots to look. And I could, I could take you straight to those places now, because they became very, very familiar. There were always flowers in the cottage. Tim would seek out the white foxgloves and the harebells and ferns from the burn. And also make up a tiny rock garden with moss and sundew plants that uh, you know, were growing up on the hill behind the cottage. And then further afield with Tim. There were always longer outings. <coughs> the game fair at Moy or the Black Isle. Kinloch Horn to collect mussels and garnets. Ardnamurkin Point and the extreme west coast or down memory lane for Timmy to Elgin, Abadar and Craig Ellicky. More than once we drove the west coast, a day on sky, or a longer trip over several days to Orkney, where our dear mutual friends David and Pan had moved to, to live, and they stopped at Letterburn to break their journey with the car absolutely packed with children, pets, including a tortoise, I remember, <laughs> and their other family detritus and we visited them only a couple of years ago. By then, Tim was in a wheelchair due to, her, due to being lame, but she very much wanted to visit Yesenby. This is a very rugged headland uh, on the mainland, uh, on the coast of mainland Orkney. <coughs> very beautiful. And the sea and the cliffs are just spectacular. But in the moor, on the cliff top, grow, grows the primula Scotica, which is a very rare and very, very small wild primula. Well, we had, to, uh, we had to go and see that. We had to find it. And we did find it. Three of us manoeuvring the wheelchair across the moor without actually tipping Timmy out <laughs> and found the, the, the beautiful, tiny primula plant. 
so she was very pleased. <laughs> and tipping her out, tipping her out of the wheelchair is a fate that I narrowly escaped in Cambridge not very long ago. We went to the Scott, uh, Scott of the Antarctic exhibition with Tim, and um, I hadn't appreciated before how uneven the pavements in uh, Cambridge are, but we kept her, kept her upright. She kept up so many interests, reading, history, food, people, especially the young. One year we took the ferry to the Isle of Rum. It was a choppy crossing, and Tim spent the time chatting to and befriending a young lass from Malay. When we got there, another ferry was trying to leave, and we arrived. One small tender was trying to embark and disembark passengers, and the lass from Malay made a solemn comment to Timmy, which she always remembered. Perhaps it applies to my little account today. It's all a terrible muddle, and someone's going to have to sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> and like to see that day, life can be choppy, and I, for one, have been very grateful for Tim's subtle and simple and solid support <laughs> over the years. Ah, right, so, Reverend Minister, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity uh, to pay tribute to the Cobble Shoot uh, to Timmy. Uh, we first met Timmy as Liverpool, parents' evening, where she was endeavouring to teach our son the mysteries of mathematics, i.e., long division, into the version of fractions and decimals, and uh, what I would call simple arithmetic. Hi, oh, yes, she says, David Pennington. Cheerful chap, bit laid back. Well, they couldn't argue with that. <laughs> so we pressed on. Next time I saw her was uh, on the 5th of. Uh, November, 77, Saturday, shoot at Cole. Coming out of myself, she was well known to our then chairman, George Gallagher, Dr. Gallagher, senior manager at the uh, I've asked a lady from Payment to pick up for us today, he said. And I was duly introduced to Timmy, uh, Miss Caddock, as I knew her. I didn't recognise her as Miss Caddock, she was in her usual uh, shooting gear, uh, muddy overalls. Uh, Waterproofs, wellies, stick, sometimes a worn out uh, a hunting whip, uh, well chewed by her dogs around her neck. <laughs> um, so I explained the shoot, gave her a map of the drives. She was interested in that. Well, first time she found a map on her shoot, glad to know where she was going. <laughs> and she did it perfectly, as she would, anyway. And she was a great help. In many ways, we had to trap up pheasants, uh, hen pheasants for her at the appropriate time, pulling something over our business suits because we're all we're all on we're all managers of one sort or another. I was a scientist, but I still had to come to work in a business suit. First thing, first light, February, early February. I don't know when. It was almost dark, just light enough to set up the trap. Come back at uh, sunset. When I was in it, take to Timmy, three or four ten pheasants, perhaps, never three or four together, one or two, and plenty of blank days. Other members also, they when there were people like that, came and did the same thing. <coughs> Timmy was grateful, and we were grateful to her for rearing these, but she put the egg in her panties. I expect uh, Paul knows all about that. <coughs> and, uh, and then she would uh, put the pulps back into a little pen we got for a, a collar. Uh, we always had to do it Timmy's way. We learned a lot from Timmy. We were enthused by her energy, her dynamism, her twin laser eyes, which everybody must know, <laughs> uh, and her fish manner. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah. On one occasion, uh, no name, no pack grill, uh, because some of uh, the opposing shoot might be here today, I don't know. Uh, we were going along uh, one of our boundaries, to me along the, uh, the ditch, um, our side of the wire, belts of uh, bramble woodland, thin strip, 
to the next drive, and uh, a couple of uh, pheasants flew out our side, we dropped them um, at the style, where there was a break in the hedge, an irate gamekeeper came up from next to a shoe, we were quite friends usually, <laughs> um, you know, what's all this, these are our birds, what's going on, said Timmy, what's the trouble? I explained. My dog was not on your side of the fence. These are our words. <laughs> Carry on. I'll say more. Um, we don't want to convert too many people. Um, so, I suppose this is it. Thank you, Terry. You'll be born in our collective memories. Thank you. Hippocrene, 
with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth, that I may drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. On a lighter note, I should like to just point out the 1924, which is Tim's vintage, it's a fantastic vintage in Bordeaux and um, most of France actually, and <laughs> the wine's still going strong, um, more or less, and so uh, you know, it's a hardy vintage, much like Timmy herself. So uh, on, the, on the lighter note, I'd like to present a story that I came across quite recently, and I'd like to think it could well have been written about Timmy. So we've got a picture of this a an ageing lady on a train travelling up to Scotland. And, and she's making her way through the carriages, looking very agitated, calling out, Is there a Catholic priest on board? No Catholic priest anywhere? And she got no reply. She went all the way down the train, and so she rushed back up the train, shouting, Is there an Anglican vicar? Is there an Anglican vicar on board? Still no joy. That's terrible. By now coming even more desperate, she ran back down the train in the other direction, huffing and puffing, and shouting, please, is there perhaps a rabbi on board? <laughs> and eventually a gentleman stood up and said, well, maybe I can be of assistance, madam. Uh, uh, I, I'm a Methodist minister. <laughs> and the lady fixed him with a stare and said, no, you're no bloody good. I need, I need a corkscrew. <laughs>
her before we ever met. <laughs> Come here, you bastard! <laughs> 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 Always dressed in brown or green, there are no other colours that I have failed dismally to <laughs> She could be seen stoically walking around on errands right up to her last days, using either two, three, or four legs adeptly, and stopping occasionally for puffing time. <laughs> Tilly was a staunch supporter of the village for over 60 years. Lots of us went to her 60th party. That was a really good day. She remained dedicated to the church and the Friends of St Peter's, of whom she was the founder member. She sat in her pew each week. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs>
Timmy followed the various progresses with avid interest and took great delight in the whole scheme. Now, some of you have a CD of a Rogation Sunday service that was commemorating um, the service on the 5th of May, 1891. Thank you, Debbie for coming up with the date since we got here this morning. There's been a lot of discussion about it. Timmy absolutely loved this. We're pretty sure that it was her idea and we wouldn't be surprised. It was an evening service and everybody in the church came dressed in Victorian costume. Um, Harry Arch, who's an absolute staunch supporter of this church for so long, was the Reverend John Linnell, whose family played an enormous part here for a very long time and are commemorated on for that day. Um, if, if ever Timmy got you onto the subject, you uh, were given the CD of the whole thing. Uh, at the end, we had to listen to it in the car because you couldn't have, nobody has CD players in the more, anymore, so you had to go and sit there solemnly. And I gather several people here still have proper CDs, so it's a good one to listen to. She enthusiastically supported so many people, clubs and societies in Pavenham, including the cricket club, the tennis club, the flower show, Pavenham Open Gardens, the cock, the Pavenham Rush Weavers, Thomas's Shoot, Vicky's Catering, John Kerman's Wine and Cheese Evenings, and many, many more. She remained diligent about providing raffle prizes for them for all these events, whether she was attending or not. She would often buy tickets, even if she knew she couldn't go. She was always supporting, supporting. She always found a way to remain a part of village life and always found a solution to her problems. Guests to safari suppers, on being directed to West Cottage for a course, <coughs> were surprised to be greeted by Catherine and Henry, <laughs> my son and daughter. Um, unable to host herself any longer, but keen to provide her house as a supper venue, Timmy had prevailed upon them to do the cooking and host her guests in her house whilst she surrounds safari around the village as a guest herself. <laughs> <laughs> Only one to host our guest, everyone. <laughs> she always, it's already been said, she always did things properly and entertained like royalty. Venison, usually from Tony. Vegetables, wine berries, raspberries, fig, figs, peaches, uh, sorry, apricots, walnuts, hazelnuts, sea kale from her garden, supplemented by smoked salmon and smoked eel from Inverall. She was sponsored to cycle annually for the Historic Churches Trust, and once she became, became unable to cycle herself, yes, you've guessed it, she encouraged others to cycle for her, whilst she remained in the village to do her stint in the church greeting the other cyclists, which I think often involved giving out Brenda's Mars bars. <laughs> She was always on the lookout to include new people to the village in its traditions and rhythms. So different to so many places you hear where people say, oh no, I'm, I'm an outsider until I've been here 50 years. Timmy absolutely welcomed people in. She was delighted when my husband David announced that he was going trout fishing with a friend. Do you know how to cast a fly? <laughs> <laughs> Knowing full well that the answer would be no. Without delay. David was out in the garden, being instructed on how to drop a fly onto a side plate. As soon as he could deliver it into a suitably small area, the lesson changed. Now you've just got to picture this. Now, when you have a fish on, you will need to know how to play it. I'll be the trout. <laughs> ran from side to side in the garden, being reeled in and keeping up a commentary. Gently, gently, keep that rod up. <laughs> Matt was in spring 2007 and she was 83. Her expertise was wide ranging and her knack for getting other people to take part always involved sharing her knowledge. You've got some good apples on that tree. Mm. Why don't you enter them in the flower show? Nothing about the flower show and entering apples. Assistance was given with selection. Suggestions that the fruit should be polished met with dismissal. 
but careful traditional presentation was explained and a prize resulted followed the next year by another. Needless to say, the celebratory drink was whiskey. <laughs> when she really could not participate herself, then she loved hearing about the progress, adventures and antics of others. She never thought of herself and always thought of others. On arrival at West Cottage, through her ever, through her ever unlocked back door, <laughs> Timmy was quick to call a cheery hello before she immediately asked her visitor for a blow-by-blow blow of what they had been doing, how a particular project was going, how a dog had performed on a shoot. Her questions were always specific, as she rarely forgot previous conversations. She was always interested and always optimistic. <coughs> how many of us here have passed completely idyllic evenings in her sitting room, watching the flames lick the logs, the fire roaring, our faces burned by the heat, curtains closed, lights dimmed, they were actually all <coughs> a drink in our hands, total perfection. Happy conversations and stories recited from throughout her life, some of which have been mentioned here already. The wonderful stories were endless. People loved her enthusiasm. Timmy was never an old lady, but a, just a true friend to many. She was totally ageless. She never moaned about her aches and pains, although they were so many. She always had a tremendous sense of fun, and of course we loved the mischievous twinkle in her eye. Generous with her time, generous with all she had, including her garden. I think it might be our climbing rose that's in her garden today, apparently still flowering pink flowers which couldn't be used to go with the brown, green and orange flowers. <laughs> <laughs> and various people and residents have had their allotments there. Even our beehives found homes. Timmy was delighted that Jean had taken on the running of the garden in the last couple of years. Perhaps a final anecdote gives the best insight into how sharp her mind remained and what a life it was possible to lead because of it. She had been sent a copy of The Gilded Fly by Edmund Crispin. Gruesome murder fiction being her main reading material. <laughs> and the accompanying letter said that the title was a quotation from Shakespeare and did she know where from. Armed with no internet, but only a copy of the complete works and her memory, she replied by return of post. You gave me one hour's good work King Lear, Act 4, Scene 6. <laughs> One hour. <laughs> Her memory for Shakespeare was impeccable, and she would recite dozens of lines at the slightest provocation. She always made gleeful promises to return to haunt us, and we hope she does. <laughs> <laughs> This is um, an extract from a Tennyson poem that Timmy used to quote and discuss, and it was often the subject of conversation over a dram. She <coughs> um, was, he was a great Tennyson enthusiast, so it seems like an appropriate thing to read. I will apologise now that it's quite gloomy, but um, she did always say that we were sent here to suffer. <laughs> Oh, I should also mention that um, it's about King Arthur and he, he's on his way to Avalon, which is a sort of mythical heaven. Then saw they how there hove a dusty barge, dark as a funeral scarf, from stem to stern beneath them. And descending, they were aware that all the decks were dense with stately forms, black stole, black hooded like a dream by these three queens with crowns of gold. And from them rose a cry that shivered to the tingling stars, and, as it were, one voice, an agony of lamentation, like a wind that trills all night in a wasteland where no one comes, or hath come, since the making of the world. 
then murmured Arthur, placed me in the barge. Then loudly cried the bold Sir Bedivere, My Lord Arthur, whither shall I go? Where shall I hide my forehead and my eyes? For now I see the true old times are dead, when every morning brought a noble chance, and every chance brought out a noble knight. Such times have been not since the light that led the holy elders with the gift of mirth. But now the whole round table is dissolved, which was an image of the mighty world, and I, the last, go forth companionless, and the days darken round me, and the years among new men, strange faces, other minds. And slowly answered Arthur from the barge. The old order changes, yielding place to new. And God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. Comfort thyself. What comfort is in me? I have lived my life, and that which I have done may he within himself make pure. But thou, if thou shouldst never see my face again, pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let thy voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. For what are men, better than sheep or goats, that nourish a blind life within the brain of knowing God? <coughs> they lift not hands in prayer, both for themselves and those who call them friend. For so the whole round earth is every way bound by gold chains about the feet of God. But now, farewell. I am going a long way to the island valley of Avalon where falls not hail or rain or any snow, nor ever wind blows loudly. But it lies deep meadowed, happy, fair with orchard lawns, and bowery hollows crowned with summer sea, where I will heal me of my grievous wound. So said he, and the barge with oar and sail moved from the brink like some full-breasted swan, that fluting a carol ere her death, ruffles her cold plume, and takes the flood with swarthy wet. Long stood Sir Bedivere, revolving many memories, till the hull looked one black dot against the verge of dawn. And on the mere, the wave died away. <coughs>
can we say about life? Perhaps the most famous comment is unrepeatable, though given some of the words that have been used so far, perhaps I would be safe enough to say it. <laughs> and I will. Life's a bitch and then you die. Personally, I prefer alternative versions like Life's a beach and so you surf. Life's a story. Make yours a bestseller. And what I discovered only recently, which I think Timmy would really approve of, life's a garden. Dig it. <laughs> Another popular saying is this one. Life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. How true. Here, though, is my personal preference. <clears throat> Life is for living. And that is exactly what Timmy did. We've heard so much today about all that she took part in and all that she enjoyed. She truly lived life to the full. I recall that she wasn't over impressed at the prospect of her 90th birthday. <laughs> but, as she said, well, having got this far, I'd better celebrate it. <laughs> and so she did, in some style. Our Bible reading talked earlier about the many things that happen in life. How there is a time for everything. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to be silent and a time to speak. And so on. The writer appears to be very philosophical, very matter of fact. There's a time for everything, so just accept it, he seems to be saying. But in fact, when this writer talks about time, he is referring to God's time. Humanity is not just exposed to all that life throws at it in a kind of like it or love it way. If the life lived acknowledges God, then he <coughs> is in control, and he will sustain the liver through it. As our reading said rather beautifully, <coughs> God has set eternity in the human heart. So for people of faith, heaven is the ultimate destination once life is past. <coughs> And that's in God's time. Timmy knew this. And her approach to life and to God was much like her approach to everything else. <laughs> Definite and with conviction. No shilly-shallying. Traditional. Although she always preferred, we've heard this a lot, she always preferred the proper way of doing things, Timmy embraced new ideas at the same time and was always very supportive of what was happening here at St Peter's Paven. Her faith was straightforward and uncomplicated. I recall her in our Bible study group on one occasion when we'd been going round the houses a bit in our discussion. Honestly, I thought she'd gone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly she said, well, it's because God loves us. Straightforward and uncomplicated, but full of faith was our Timmy. On another occasion, when studying the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, and so on, barely had the leader finished speaking before Timmy interjected with, but I don't want to be meek. <laughs> I think we can honestly say she probably never was. <laughs> I know there are many people within this community and in the wider sphere whom she supported, often when they were going through great personal trial. And they gained strength 
and the will to carry on from this tiny lady who lived out her faith in a private, but matter of fact kind of way, but always generous with her wisdom. I can imagine her right now sitting there in that pew at the front, fixing on me with her laser eyes, <laughs> listening to me saying this, and watching her face screw up in protest at my complimentary words. But that was our Timmy who lived out her life of faith to the full. I found a poem which I think she would approve of. In fact, I could almost hear her say it. If I should go before the rest of you, break not a flower, nor inscribe a stone, nor, when I am gone, speak in a Sunday voice, but be the usual selves that I have known. Weep if you must, parting is hell, but life goes on, so sing as well. Our reading spoke of a time to weep and a time to mourn, but that is not today. Today is a time to laugh and a time to dance because her faith has taken this lovely lady to heaven, her final destination. And so we celebrate Timmy's earthly existence and we rejoice in her eternal life. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you- 
join with me now in the traditional form of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven,
In your tender mercy, you sent your Son to restore in us your image. In obedience to your will, he gave up his life for us, bearing in his body our sins on the cross. By your mighty power, you raised him from the grave and exalted him to the throne of glory. Rejoicing in this victory and trusting in your promise to make alive all who turn to Christ, we commend Timmy to your mercy. And we join with all your faithful people and the whole company of heaven in the one unending song of praise. Glory and wisdom and honour be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Now please be seated for our final blessing. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, make us perfect in every good work to do his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always.